So there has been lots of discussion around the uh, cost of the party platforms and how to pay for those promises. In this election, the Office of the Parliamentary Budget Officer has been given the powers to vet party promises, but not all promises are being vetted and there are limits on what the PBO can reveal and what it can look at. How fundamental is it to the voting process for Canadians to know early what promises cost? Let's get some perspective from Canada's first parliamentary budget officer. He's Kevin Page. He's the president and CEO of the Institute of uh, Fiscal Studies and Democracy at the University of Ottawa. He's with me now. Good to see you again. Good to be here. Uh, to be clear, this whole process of the PBO involved in election <coughs> costing, vetting, and so on, that actually started under you, right? Well, actually it started, it was, uh, it was an initiative brought in by the Liberals in 2015. So they... They made the office independent and they expanded the mandate. And this was part of the expansion of the mandate. Okay. Uh, so let's start with what, what we're seeing the parties do. I mean, we're days into the campaign, eight days into the campaign. Um, what do you think is the new mandate of the PBO? Does it seem to be working? Yes. Yeah, I think uh, all things considered, I think it's working very well. I think some parties are making better use of it in these early days. Uh, I would point to the, the Conservatives doing an excellent job with each initiative that, you know, they announce now on a daily basis. We're getting, you know, the press release from the party. We're getting their backgrounders. We're getting the PBO cost of reports. So, I mean, folks like yourself, citizens, uh, civil society groups, we go to these reports. We get a sense, okay, when do these initiatives start? How do they roll out? What are the, like, the, the taxpayer costs? And I think that's a lot. And other parties are a little bit behind, but we, you know we hear that they're going to be they're they're using PBO, and we'll wait to see their cost of platforms. But so, what do you think about what's what's the added what's the benefit to the voter? As you point out, the Conservatives are doing it, the NDP is doing it, uh, the Greens say they're going to get the whole platform costed at some point by the PBO. The Liberals say they're only going to look, have the PBO look at some of the specific measures, and we'll see those when we have a full platform announcement. So what's the benefit to the, the voter of, of having this work in lock, lockstep? Announcement, costing, yeah. PBO <laughs> endorsement. Yeah, I think in some cases, um, Peter, like again, they say in, in these sort of big material announcements that we've heard, the biggest probably being the conservative initiative or proposal rather to to lower the, the bottom tax rate from 15 to you know, 3.75. Like I think, you know, there is, a, you know, t that's a big number. Uh, six billion dollars and uh, six billion dollars overall annually fully implemented and so you know thanks to PBO we get to see like you know when they costed this when are you starting this when does this start it doesn't start next year right. it starts you know a little more than a year and a half down the road so we get to see the profile and we know you know we know that PBO did the costing P people like me know the models that they've used and so we know basically where to go if we want to understand what's the distributional impact. So I think, you know, again, I think it adds a lot of bona fides to the announcement. And again, they're independent. Mm -hmm. They're not, uh, you know, it's not political. And they do this in a nice two-pager. We, we saw the Conservatives talk about a $1.5 billion. They're going to find a $1.5 billion in, in cuts every year, they say, from uh, corporate subsidies in this country. Uh, and that's endorsed by the PBO. Is that, is, you're wondering about that endorsement, whether that's the right endorsement to make. Yeah, I don't know that PBO endorsed it. That may be, it's a strong word, but they, they definitely put out a backgrounder, which is really just a table saying it's 1.5. We can't, there's not much where you can really do it, but they put their, their, their name their on Their name's it. attached to the, yeah, they I can say they, they ran it by the PBO. They ran it by the PBO. And for somebody like, like me, when I look at something like that, and um, my guess is they, they probably had the same questions internally, but maybe they're under some pressure to release that backgrounder. But for somebody like me, $1.5 billion corporate subsidy, I think, you know, the you know, Mr. Shear is absolutely right. There's definitely waste there. We could find savings. The question is, how big is the savings? And, you know, he highlights a number of initiatives. Maybe it's 50 or $100 million a year. He says he can get $1.5 billion a year. You don't think so? Well, I think when people like me will go, we'll look at the public accounts, what's the total spend in, you know, in, in, in the Department of Innovation and Science, or the old I Industry Canada Department, it's like $3.5 billion a year. If you add the regional agencies, you know, Space Agency, uh, you know, the Research Department, the National Research Department, you maybe get as high as $7 billion. So $1.5 billion on that base, that's a big number. That's a big savings cut. And, you know, if you, again, if you look to the tax expenditure side, the Conservatives use a lot of tax credits and exemptions. If you look at that list uh, for businesses, I, my guess is they're not going to touch that. So they're going to have a hard time finding $1.5 billion a year. So should PBO have put a backgrounder out? My guess is if I was putting the background out, it would have been critical. Like, what's the base? What's the governance right. process? I, yeah, I'd want to know those, uh, those, those questions. Okay. Um, so let, let, let me go back to the Liberals now. So the Liberals are, are, are not costing each proposal as they go. Uh, should they be? 
Yeah, my, my guess is, uh, my, my assumption rather is that, you know, the, uh, they're, they're big announcements, the, you know, the ones they've announced today with respect to pensions, respect to old age security, uh, what are the fiscal impacts. Like, I assume that they, they've worked with PBO on that, and we're going to see that, you know, the, those two pages, those costing notes when they release their platform. That's their decision to do it that way. Um, yeah, I guess if that's the case, if this, if, if PBOs looked at this and says, yeah, those numbers make sense to us, why wouldn't you say it? Like, why wouldn't you do what the others are doing? Say that on the same day you announce it. This has been looked at by the PBO. Yeah, I would I, prefer it that way. And maybe the way they, the, maybe it's their more from a political perspective. They think that, um, you know, they're getting a, a, a political impact every day. The news is covering these sorts of announcements, the announcements that we had today and other days. And then when they roll out their platform, you know, I think you'll not only will you get a kind of a recapitulation of all these measures, but, you know, people will look at this sort of fiscal plan, what's happening to the deficit track, et cetera. But then, then you'll see how is PBO used. The rules around the PBO, he, he, he looks at stuff that the parties bring to him or an independent can, can bring something uh, to him to look at, but uh, he doesn't release it unless the parties release it. And it, is, is that a weakness in the process? Seems to me, and I'll give you an example. Uh, let's say a, a pick an announcement. A party says it's, you know, here, here's our announcement. It costs this amount of money. And then they run it by the PBO. And the PBO goes, actually, no, it's going to be way higher than that. But we don't ever get to know the PBO number, do we? If the party doesn't want to say the PBO doesn't think this is right, we don't hear that. Well, you know, my again, my assumption is, and maybe we'll see if it gets tested, that uh, if there is that type of scenario where, um, you know, PBO was asked to provide a costing on a very specific measure, the political party announces the very same measure but with a different number, my guess is you'll hear from the Parliamentary Budget Officer on that particular scenario. If there's a big, if they change the number, I think PBO would probably put out their, their costing report and would show that there's a different number. Um, but yeah, they definitely, like behind the scenes, they worked out a process, the priority budget officer with all the parties, you know, um, the, you know, here's how we're going to do it. We need to get your measures in early. We will, you know, this is how we will release it. Um, and yeah, I think it's a positive thing. We know that the priority budget officer has worked with departments in a, in a, in a, I think in a right. very inclusive way. I really struggled in my day to work with departments to get information from departments. I think this is some bridge building that's going on. Okay. Uh, what's missing from the, con we, we haven't heard the parties talk a lot about, uh, how they're going to pay for stuff, just what, what, what they're going to do um, and the promises they're making. Is that something missing from the, the fiscal conversation uh, as yes. you and I speak now? What more should we be hearing? Yeah, I think what's missing, Peter, is uh, we will need to see and, and we will need to see the fiscal plan for these platforms. And, um, you know, we've already, I think the, the, the Conservatives already probably announced something in the neighborhood of, you know, $8 billion annually in, in, base, in measures, you know, offset with this, potentially this $1.5 billion corporate tax cut. So, again, what does this mean to the deficit track? Like, are the, our finances, are they in good shape? What's happening to the deficit? How fast is that stock of debt going up? Um, and, and in the context of uh, uh, a lot of global uncertainty. Very you know, much we, so. we don't know where the economies of, of necessarily this country, but of the rest of the world are headed, and that can have a huge impact, but no one's talking about that. No, I think there was a question in the very first debate uh, last week around um, what would potentially happen. I don't think the party leaders, I think Mrs. May and, and Mr. Singh kind of alluded to the fact that they would let the deficit go up. Mm -hmm. um, nobody really talked about, again, Peter, when we, you know, when we were looking at this issue back in 2008, we needed a stimulus package. So what would be the nature of those sorts of investments? How would you respond? I think it's, it is likely, certainly the bond markets are saying a chance of having some sort of recession. This week alone, we saw a shock to yeah. the oil price market, the oil markets. Something like this could trigger a recession what will be the response? Yeah, and so you need, I think, we need to assess that. And actually, my, my office, the Institute of Fiscal right. Studies and Democracy, we're going to look at that issue. Uh, among some others, I bet. Uh, but yeah, but certainly looking at the fiscal plan. Are these fiscal plans, are they credible? Like we'll look at those assumptions. And if they use the PBO economic assumptions, I think they would be credible. We, we think those are credible. But your point about how would they manage uncertainty? Will the platforms address that issue? We haven't talked about that. and We haven't seen that in the platforms. Are these fiscal plans, are they responsible? Is it a responsible medium-term plan to be running how, the deficits of $20, $30 $30 billion a year potentially over the next five years? Is it? I don't think so. Not in this environment. Is our would our is our fiscal structure is it sustainable? Like what happens when, as with aging demographics? What happens to that? It, is it? <laughs> as it we are sustainable right now. Right. But again, if under some of these plans, depending on how what kind of revenues are increased to, to, to offset potentially pharmacare. 
um, universal, potentially a universal basic income type of proposal. Uh, it, you know, again, it really depends on, on measures we haven't seen yet. And then let's look at the transparency of these initiatives. So far, I think the transparency has been quite good, thanks to PBO. All right. Kevin Page, always good to talk to you. Thanks for coming. Thank you, sir.